that the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable people. Good evening and welcome. It's the 27th of February 2017. We're coming to you live and direct from our Stein Studio Complex here in Ratmalana. My name is Sonali Vanika Babage. On the 8th of March each year, and indeed this year as well, World Women's Day will be marked. So we thought it would be apt to talk about this over 50% of society and the world that juggles with inequalities. On this edition of Face the Nation, we have a panel of eminent personalities who are joining us. Ms. Kamani Jinadasa, Gender Consultant and Attorney at Law. Good evening and welcome to the show. It's your first time. Yep. Uh, Ms. Sama Rajakaruna, who's an independent consultant on gender equity and women's rights. Another first. Good evening and welcome evening. to you too. Ms. Madhu Disanayaka, Director of Advocacy for HIV AIDS at the Sri Lanka Family Planning Association. Good evening to you. Good evening. And finally... Our uh, only gentleman on the show tonight, Mr. Lakshan Dais, who is an attorney at law and human rights activist. Good evening to Hello. you. Good evening. Uh, I think uh, we'll start first of all with uh, Ms. Kamani Jinadasa, gender consultant and attorney at law. Kamani, you do a lot of work uh, with working with uh, men and boys to prevent the perpetration of violence against women. How serious an issue is this in Sri Lanka given the fact that we have necessary laws the legislation is in place but what are some of the practical difficulties that you have to encounter in your work I think um, as you said quite rightly we have laws and uh, the biggest issue has been in terms of enforcement in terms of people actually holding those who have committed the offense against them, especially the women, holding these men accountable for the crimes that they have committed. Um, and I think um, largely the issue lies around the fact that our culture, um, within our culture there's a feeling of shame and humiliation if a woman or a child or a girl has experienced some kind of abuse. Um, and also I feel that um, when it comes to enforcing the law, there's a lack of seriousness towards the issue. There's a lack of feeling of those who are responsible for actually enforcing the law and taking action, um, taking the issue seriously enough. So are you saying that there's an implicit acceptance within society for such violence to be perpetrated? Yeah. Um, I think um, instead of just saying it anecdotally, I would like to just refer to this study that I was involved in a few years ago around masculinities where 1,700 men were interviewed. And something that came out really strong was uh, the levels of impunity that men experienced for the crimes or especially sexual violence that they perpetrated. And there was a specific question in this, uh, quest in this survey which was asked about uh, from men who had actually perpetrated sexual violence against women. Um, amongst those men, how many of them were actually held accountable in any way, be it even from their families or even, even who had experienced legal consequences? And the amount was less than 3%, which means that 97% or more just, you know, have no experience, no, you know, no sense of being held accountable for what they do. So then what happens there? So is there a lacuna in, in the law? Where are we going wrong as a society? I feel it's the sense of acceptance of normalization of violence against women and girls. And um, it, it comes from so many, uh, so many places. It comes from the normalization of it within the home, uh, within the schools, within society. And um, the work around it is to make people understand that any type of violence is, is, should be not tolerated. Um, so yeah, those are the key things for now. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to move my attention to Sama Rajakaruna, who's an independent consultant on gender equity and women's rights. Uh, Sama, earlier on, um, uh, before we started this show, you said that um, you, your work also revolves around sexual harassment at the workplace. Uh, how, how does your work feature in, in terms of uh, dealing with the private sector? Um, I started working with the private sector a couple of years ago because uh, I think the private sector has also realized that uh, sexual harassment has a great impact on their companies. Uh, it has an impact on the profit, it has an impact on uh, the turnover of staff, it has an impact on uh, the name that is given to a company. So they've realized that sexual harassment has a great impact on the company itself. So lots of private sector companies are now uh, taking this issue seriously and trying to address the core issue of uh, sexual harassment which is gender inequality and discrimination. Uh, so I'm doing some very interesting work with the John Keels group um, where they are s talking about uh, gender equality and gender-based violence to all their staff uh, uh, amongst all the companies under the John Keels group. Let's move away from the private sector. Uh, for example, uh, the garment, uh, the garment, garment industry. industry of mm -hmm. Sri Lanka, where there is a lot of scope for sexual harassment to take place. Um, how do we deal with uh, such issues, uh, Sama? Okay, we're talking about the garment sector because lots of issues have come up with the garment sector. But it's not, I must first of all say that it's not just the garment sector that faces this issue. It, it covers all sorts of companies, be it plantation companies, insurance companies, it could be any form of organization and there could be sexual harassment. Uh, with the garment sector, it is... I suppose it is more visible, people talk about it and that's why we've heard so much about sexual harassment in the garment sector, especially with uh, things like say um, the fact that the vast majority of the workers in the garment sector are women when it comes to the, the, the lower level work that is there, not, not the higher management. So uh, we know for a fact that Sexual harassment is mainly faced by women. I'm not saying that sexual harassment is not faced by men. Uh, it's mainly faced by men, uh, perpetrate, uh, sorry, women, perpetrated by mainly men. Uh, so there's, that is one of the reasons that we hear a lot about the garment sector and sexual harassment. How do we then engage these perpetrators uh, and ensure that uh, repetition is, is not... Uh, I'd just like to add, what, add to what Kamani mentioned, that yes, we need to engage with the perpetrators, but it has to be a far more holistic approach, where we talk about this issue, uh, talk about gender equality from a very young age. Uh, sometimes even before a child is born. During our training programs we talk about how we prepare uh, the room in pink and blue depending on the sex of the child, the gender of the child. So from there onwards we stereotype and we put men and women in boxes. That's where the whole issue starts. So we have to address this issue in a way, very uh, holistic manner and uh, address the root causes of the problem. How do we go about addressing this issue in a holistic manner, in your opinion? Okay. Uh, one is, like Kamini mentioned, uh, areas, school system. Right now, even in this day and age, my children are taught that women do these kind of work, uh, men do these kind of work. So this whole stereotyping of what it is to be a man and what it is to be a woman. So at the school level you have to talk about gender equality, uh, non-violence, uh, non-discrimination. Uh, and at other levels also, like say media can play a huge role in this, where you don't have just stereotypical roles played by uh, women. You you make it more kind of uh, progressive. Uh, women uh, take on different roles. It's not only a, a woman as a mother or a caregiver or a caretaker at home. It's uh, women play 
various roles in society. So giving more prominence to these different roles and that's the way media can play. Uh, talked about education, talked about media, uh, even at officers. Now, for example, I mentioned one organization, I'm sure there are many others, that take on the initiative of addressing the issue of violence against women and gender inequality. So Thank you very much. it's our whole responsibility. And in addition, we will also be uh, speaking about uh, the role that the government has to play in ensuring that uh, discrimination um, is eliminated, how laws need to be brought in, how its effective implementation and enforcement is also looked into. Madhu Desanayaka is, uh, of course, the Director for Advocacy for HIV AIDS at the Sri Lanka Family Planning Association. Uh, Madhu, much of the atrocities uh, committed against women occur partly because the victim herself is not aware of her rights. How important is rights awareness among women in Sri Lanka? Mm. I think uh, the rights, uh, the, the knowledge on rights needs to, be, um, needs to be known by everyone, not only women. Because uh, this is this is uh, this is the issue. We tend to think gender-based violence is uh, against women, and therefore women need to know. No, everybody needs to know their rights. Everybody needs to know what are their obligations. Because as a country that has ratified CEDAW, much of the discussions have happened in the recent past about uh, how we have submitted our country statement or how. The country has um, progressed in addressing the issues raised by last CEDO uh, committee recommendations. So in that, we, we say we have to achieve substantive equality, not the general equality. We have to address non-discrimination. And there is a strong state obligation for that. So in my view, I think uh, what, what is most important is we need to start start building our younger generations uh, on, on the rights-based uh, perspective, uh, also giving what is, what is respect, what is equality means, what is non-discrimination means. I think only when you start the foundation with those, uh, those groundings that we'll be able to start talking about human rights and what are our rights and the fact that human rights and women's rights are no difference to each other. It's just that one party uh, is not uh, being um, not being able to exercise their rights because of the fact that they have been treated or they are being treated differently by the society and being seen as a second class citizen. So to address that we all need to know. We all need to know what our rights are so that uh, so that we don't discriminate. I mean, we are not saying, you know, men don't need to know their rights. Women and men both need to know their rights and that, that men and women are equal. So what's stopping the men and women of Sri Lanka from knowing their rights? Where do we learn our rights? That's what we need to ask. Where, where do we teach our children? These are your rights. Where do we teach adults? These are your rights. Unless you take up... Uh, studies on human rights, do we actually discuss, because I, I personally think it should be part of the religious studies curriculum, because human rights basically addresses most of the religious principles as well. So it needs to start from somewhere and I think it's high time that uh, we think about how we inculcate these things or include these aspects in our curriculum educational curriculum because that's the only way that we could actually impart the rights-based education and getting to know your human rights. Thank you very much. Uh, and finally, Mr. Lakshan Dice, attorney at law and human rights activist. Ending violence against women. Uh, the shame surrounding uh, domestic violence is a barrier to talking about the issue. So where do these women, especially women, go? Well, uh, I think uh, I, I would like to start this way. Sometimes 
the the very institutions that needs to be aware about law or, or domestic laws are not still not ready to face the realities example i i appeared one of the domestic violence case and there was a lady magistrate and she said this is the most draconian law i ever know about in this country so then i i have to argue with her and say no this is one of unique laws so if the judiciary thinks like that part of judiciary even even a minority of judiciary things like that where can the victims can go so in my opinion that's that's a huge task in front of us when it comes to the the, the violence against women uh I, before we go for violence i think i we will i also like to talk about the opportunities now if you take the the legal profession the majority of the legal profession are women and in in 10 years time they will be absolute majority more than 75% but see how many councils we have and and in the in the courts how many men dominates the entire courts and if you go to court of appeal or supreme court you can see sea of young uh, uh uh women lawyers but only few men dominates the entire the the counseling part so it's it's same with various other professions so first for me is is when where the women is going to take the space and how the the right thinking men going to accommodate them how men and women going to take uh, go in partnership to achieve the changes so without that i think uh, uh, i mean this the violence against women and discrimination will remain forever i mean we are we are not talk about things like slavery in this country but in our country there is a one particular law it's a sla- almost like slavery where the estate women have to take the permission from their boss or their employer if she wants to go to another job and nobody challenges no organization law nobody is challenging it is called family background report for the family background report it's it must to have the estate superintendent signature a state superintendent is your boss is your employer and why why do you need your employer's uh, signature to go abroad to go to another job only in slavery you need your employer's uh, uh, signature so there are so many things that we need to change in this country and and we are not practically implementing section 345 of the penal code where it says even you are staring at a woman you are liable for a punishment there are so many laws we have but i think uh, i think some we, we all have to start in a practical level how are we going to address uh, uh, i mean in in the private sector in the state sector in judiciary in 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 the in the professions we all have to start creating space if we can create space there will be groups that who can fight against the the, the violence against women i mean as as madhu said we 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 most of us we don't know what are right, what are the rights that uh, we can enjoy so uh, i mean for that in my opinion what we need to do is creating spaces so once you create spaces you you will be able to fight this whole uh, fight against the uh, violence against women Uh, Mr Dias um, earlier on in the conversation um you mentioned a point where um I I just want to ask you are you advocating for a program where uh, judici- the judiciary is sensitized towards uh, this process the judiciary and law enforcement authorities I I yes I no I'm I'm not I'm not uh, doing any any project or anything like that but whenever possible I I challenge I mean uh, that's you, all I can do. Do you think do. there's a need for there this? There is a, there's a huge need not only judiciary in all our professions in in the society in religions. I mean what what a fight we need to have uh, female uh, clergy in in Catholic church. And there are more than 3000 uh, bikunis are fighting for their equal rights as as equal with bikus. They are not they are not given that opportunity. Islam what is, what is the state of the women? Hinduism is still they are, they are they are no more better than the devadasis so these religions also need to ch- 
change their 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 institutions and the state needs to be changed and the judiciary needs to be changed and even even the school level even even the education institutes so we're talking about a paradigm shift but yes of course yes. we have been talking about this paradigm shift uh, across decades but uh, and i'd like to pose this question to all of you on the panel uh, why hasn't there been any change uh, i would say that there have been changes uh, we've taken sometimes like three steps forward and sometimes we've come back two steps depending on you were talking about um, state and state responsibility depending on um, what kind of interest there is by the state to promote gender equality we've gone forward and there have been times where we've come back as well so there have been there has been progress i i won't say that there hasn't been any progress at all um, i mean uh, we've we are signatories to cedo as madhu was saying and without any reservations whatsoever unlike so many other countries in the asian region that is definitely a big step forward uh, we've got different kinds of laws uh, i think in 1995 2005 different laws have uh, come into effect but still there are lots of loopholes there are lots of issues that we need to address we can't just sit back and say that you know we've achieved these things so everything is perfect there are lots of loopholes uh, yeah come if, on if i could add on i something that i felt very strongly is how as a nation we lack this um, the sense of uh, legal activism um we're very uh, laid back uh, we have these laws uh, we have enough space uh, of course it also depends on the judicial system or the system at the time uh for example i was involved in this hiv uh, rights case and and i think the only reason why we went ahead with filing it was because we were in in, in an environment where we felt that the judiciary would take an independent decision on it so that also matters a lot but i think as a nation we are very reluctant i feel to question authority and question authority using the mechanisms that are available and i think each time there's a there's an opportunity to create the mechanism um something that has really struck me hard is how in bangladesh for example women take such a huge a lead role especially in the communities in terms of enforcing their legal rights um through the court system itself they really push it and and as a result they've really been able to to really uh push the domestic laws and and you know the response of the government through that legal activism um so i feel i feel as as sama said and everyone has said like we we do have um we do have the good the good legislation a lot of things are in place and and nothing will be perfect but i think also as a people as as a population we also th- there is a role that has to be played it's not only civil society civil society tries to create uh the space and and impart the knowledge but there has to be this feeling of you know let's push this let's take things forward some and sort of ownership as such some sort of ownership and i and i think something that is really emerging very strongly these days um has been uh the pushing for the amendment of the muslim law um uh, you can see so many things happening it's it's been i think it's been pretty fantastic all um, right thank you very much uh, well i think i need to uh hand over the mic to uh, both Sharita and Nadeem uh, but before that um for um complete disclosure's sake uh, we need we spoke about policy makers and the importance of legislation um we did invite to be on our show tonight uh, Sudarshini Fernando Pule Rosi Senanayaka and MP Hirunika Premachandra all three of them were unable to make it on tonight's show Nadeem Majid over to you Sharita you want to go first Yeah I think I'll go first. <laughs> Thank you Sonali. Uh my first question is to um Sama. Um now we've t- we are coming out of a war situation, uh decades of war. Um is there actually a rise in violence against women? Um 
or is there a lack of data to ascertain the current situation? Yeah. Definitely the data that we have is not enough and even the data that we have we can't really say whether it's an increase in the reporting or whether it's an increase in the violence. That's very difficult uh, and even if you take the the reported number of cases it is estimated that maybe about 10 percent of the cases are ever reported right so what is reported is just a small percentage of what is actually happening in this country right uh, but do you see an increase in reports of of yes. Complaints? Uh, yes. Uh, statistically there has been an increase in the report of violence. Um, that is to be expected if you look at the, the, the reports of other countries that have come out of wars. Militarization has a great impact on violence against women. Right? So definitely uh, as a country that has faced uh, a violent period for the last 30 years and we've just come out of it, definitely it has an impact on uh, the violence experienced by women. Yes. Um, can I go? Yeah. Kamani, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, the Women's UN Report Network has said that 30% uh, to 40% of Sri Lankan women suffer from some kind of um, violence, while more than 60% of women across Sri Lanka are victims of domestic violence. Uh, could you uh, shed some light as to in um, which levels of society do, does this take place? Is it in uh, rural, remote areas or can you give us some uh, perspective? I think that's one of my favorite questions because um, there's always this assumption that domestic violence is more prevalent amongst people in poverty affected areas. Uh, but domestic violence is across the board. And actually reports have shown, the thing is, if you understand the nature of the act of domestic violence, it's an act of power over uh, another person. So studies show that um, the more powerful a person is, the more violence that will, will take place. And we see it everywhere, not, even, not just within a family unit, but even in work or in any environment. And um, um, it's, it's, it's quite clear that now, for example, in this study that you referred to, uh, the arm where it was conducted in Bangladesh, for example, uh, it came out that the Brahmin caste, among the Brahmin caste, there was the highest rate of violence against women because uh, this, the question of impunity also comes in because the more powerful you are, the less you question the person in power. And, you know, in the Brahmin caste, you know, basically you don't question. So across my work and across my engagement with people, I have seen and you know spoken to people who are across the board being affected by domestic violence. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's really important if we want to address the issue of domestic violence properly and effectively. We need to move away from this mindset that it's only a particular you know group of people in the lower income range that are affected. Um, uh, could, on, could, on that. On that subject, that? yes, yes, yeah. Sama. Yeah, now I've got this um, report by Women in Need. Uh, it says it's called Voices of Survivors: Case Stories of Domestic Violence Victims, uh, compiled by uh, Dr. Ramani Jaisun. If you look at this report, you'll find educated people, uneducated people, people who are really rich, people who are really poor, people from Colombo, people from other parts of Sri Lanka so it's it's actually huge it's a, it's a huge myth that it happens like Kamini said that it happens only to a certain group of people uh, some is that report from uh, for 2016 no 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 this okay. is uh, not sure of the date uh, let me let me get back to you um, the reason couple of years, a couple of years ago 796 cases um, 2000 at, yeah, about three, four years ago, but I don't think that it's 2012, May 2012. Okay. The reason I ask is that uh, I was doing some research today actually and uh, on the IPS blog, this is from the Gender Based Violence Forum for 2006-2007, again covering the same areas that you were on. They surveyed a, a group of women uh, covering all of those indicators. Uh, and when it comes to education as well, 
uh, among women with high education, the question that they were asked was, can a husband be justified uh, for beating their wife? Uh, they'd been asked uh, four separate questions for burning the food, for neglecting the children, for going out without telling them, and uh, for refusing intercourse. Uh, among women with high education, more than 40% felt that they justified. Among women with little to no education, that figure is greater than 50%. And even with uh, wealth or income, uh, among the lowest income, it was uh, f greater than 55%. And even with high income, uh, women with high incomes, it was still greater than 40%. Uh, and the figures are much the same even when it comes to urban, rural, and plantation mm -hmm. estate. So 2006 to 2007, six years later, 2012, much the same. There's been no change in that. Yeah, I mean, if you look at this, it says education qualification of victim survivors. The highest number of victim survivors are people who have got a secondary education, right? And it's very no education is very low. Do and you, if think, you look at do the you think that says something about our education system itself? I'm sure it does. <laughs> that even with the. Uh, High, higher education qualifications, yeah, like yeah. university the educated women yeah. who still think that, you know, it's the, the, justified the in some cases. The issue here is, like Kamani said, yeah. the issue here is not about education or uh, your income status or uh, your geographical location. That's not what the issue is. The issue here is about uh, power. It's how you use the power, right? When somebody has power and the another person has less power or no power, the person who has power can use that power in a violent manner. So it's all about power. <coughs> Madhu, how do we yeah. give that power to women? Um, how do you evenly distribute the power? I think it's also how we, I mean, if you look at two individuals, sometimes this physical, two physical bodies when you look at, you, you sometimes wonder whether this, this male partner could actually hit this woman because sometimes physically one party would be you know even the female party may look very strong so this is what we need to understand even if you are physically strong still you're emotionally you're being suppressed you're being told that you are at a lower level so the the power dynamics again I think that is where the education should come in because without without having that discussion within our education okay we we have achieved gender parity <coughs> that does not say that we have addressed the issues of gender equality gender parity for enrollment in school education is fine but if you look at our education itself, what are we giving out to our children? How often do we allow our children to question the issues that they face in school? And how often young girls, uh, are, uh, they, they are made to feel that they are discriminated within their own environments. I mean, the environments that they move around in, during their school time. So, so therefore, as an adult, it's, it's not that easy to change once your behavior is set and once your attitudes are being formed. It's not easy for us to change Laksh something. Uh, Lakshman said something very uh, interesting about the involvement of uh, religious groups and the need for cultural change. Now, whenever there has been an attempt for education reform, uh, specifically when it comes to things like uh, sex ed or gender-based education, we've seen a lot of resistance uh, one of the reasons why legislators don't even want to go near it, uh, where it's like a hot potato that they don't want to touch, is that you're going to face a lot of resistance from religious groups. How do you address that? But I, I have to say that legislators in the recent past are trying to address, because I think we have enough evidence, global evidence as well as local evidence, to say the importance of comprehensive sexuality education. One thing is, we had reproductive health education. But then we need to realize, is it, is it reproductive health education that we need? Or is it more onto relationship and understanding the 
diverse aspects of sexuality that we need to impart, that we need to uh, make children uh, knowledgeable. So now we are coming to that. One thing with, with the reproductive part, I think we, we managed to, up to a certain level, we, because that was mainly focusing on uh, avoiding pregnancies and avoiding STIs. But now we have realized that the issues are far beyond than that. It's how do you deal with relationships? How do you address violence? How do you how do you recognize violence? Am I in a good relationship? Am I being being forced to do certain things within my relationship? What is my sexual citizenship? Am I happy in this relationship? These things were not taught and these things were not identified in the past. But we are now identifying these and I think there is a tendency at this moment to see how we can slowly uh, engage in this process but uh, curriculum revision is a great task it cannot be happened overnight but I think the efforts are being made at least in a smaller scale that let's start and sometimes even at a younger age not at the age of 12 or 11 but even at around age 6 or 7 where you talk about respect and equality and dignity and non-discrimination that sort of um, principles uh, how do you change <coughs> there's a i see a need to there needs to be great change in mindsets as well uh, lakshan was talking earlier about the bar and how while the bar may be in numbers dominated by women the actual power is still with men let aside the bar even what a traditionalist or a, a, a chauvinist would call a traditionally female profession, like nursing. Uh, the Government Nursing Officers Association, I think until fairly recently, if I'm not mistaken, still uh, the president is a man. Uh, how do you, so clearly, uh, I mean, a lot, a large uh, majority of nurses in this country are members of that association. Uh, and the nursing profession in Sri Lanka is almost entirely uh, women if you look at it in percentages how do you change mindsets is there a fear among women uh, in this country to take on positions of power of uh, responsibility shall, shall i say something on that yeah now take our songs right uh, now there's a famous song visirunu malpete do tatagat kumari now what is this song talks about if you lose your virginity you're no more person and you have to behave like that and and then the, the famous another song uh, talk about bindunu uh, kale and you know all sort of things so culturally right we are framed to look at in one one narrow minded uh, uh, focus so by every means our, our most of our reality shows what we are seeing today we are ridiculing women we are ridiculing transgender that's the style today if you go through most of our reality shows you're only ridiculing women and you're ridiculing chance. That's the laughing stock for all of us. We are also watching these reality shows and we are laughing at women. We are laughing at uh, transgenders. So the culturally, we are extremely backward in my opinion. We, we, are, we are nowhere even closer to a modern world. Even though we are talking about we have a literacy rate of 98% and uh, best education and all sort of things. Culturally, we are backwards. Culturally, we are backwards because our religions are backward. All our four religions are backward. I take your point that uh, the nurses association, the Buddhist monk runs one nurses association, another friend of mine runs another association. Mr. So, Dias? Have you ever uh, asked this friend of yours why he is the head of the nurses <laughs> association? Well, good, good question. I must ask from him when I meet him next time. But I mean, at least he will say that I'm, I'm working on political, but both are doing the political uh, political way they are working. I think I think it is a very good question, Nadim. Why nurses cannot find their uh, uh, women leader uh, instead of uh, a monk and another man? Kami, I I, the question was, is there a fear among women to take on positions of power? I, I just wanted to add, how come we don't have male nurses as much as female nurses? Again, because it's seen as the caregiving part is a woman's role and therefore more women should be doing that. So th this is again another question. So administratively you have a male 
who would be more comfortable in doing that role whereas you have you know your the rest of the flock is seen as the people who are going about with their normal routine but is being managed or being instructed by a male so again like you said yeah, it's, it's, you know that, that that's the cultural uh, perspective that we are bringing into the 21st century and we are not asking why not that many men are in, interested in getting into the nursing field because i'm sure if they come in because in other countries we have so many male nurses we have even midwives male midwives on our panel tonight uh, we have two experts in uh, gbv uh, gender based violence uh, violence is not only perpetrated against women exclusively but also against men uh, transgender um so i'd like to ask uh, you kamani um of the recent incident where 15 um 15 boys of the agriculture faculty at perodeni university uh were um taken into custody and uh, they were remanded over um sexually harassing uh eight uh, members of the same faculty uh, juniors uh what is this culture is this a culture of sadism or inferiority how do you explain this it's um i think when it comes to i i'm so glad that you started bringing up this aspect of gender based violence also affecting men as well we don't talk enough about it yeah. and um to use the word sadism is a very strong word i think there's there's this whole history of what is the mentality what is the psyche what has happened to people to feel that the way they can assert their power once again um uh, is through uh using violence also against another man um now once again if we go back to this study that i were i referred to earlier uh the research showed that we have about 4% of our population who have experienced homophobic violence which means that uh they have been subject to do you know homophobic you know hope uh, assumptions of being a homosexual but also this there was a a similar percentage of men who have also perpetrated or yeah perpetrated uh, sexual violence against other men mm. and the thing is as a country we don't we don't look at it we don't see it we don't uh, recognize it uh, you asked the question about you know the increase of violence against uh, women in the post war setting and something that comes out that has come out is also that a lot of the husbands who were dealing with post war trauma uh took to drinking etc etc and therefore there was a increase in perpetration of violence against women and and that whole aspect of the mental health element of men um having uh, gone through a cycle themselves of violence is something we really don't uh, talk enough about um in my own experience i had a, a youth center it's an organization um which focuses on working with young people and the prime aim of it was to break this cycle of violence because uh we know that boys who have experienced some, some kind of child abuse or violence grow, while growing up they are more likely to perpetrate violence as they grow older and at the moment we're dealing with a, a a case that just brings it out so strongly about two boys who who have been abused by their father who are now becoming abusers and they they're not even they're still 15 16 so um you I, i mean there are a number of elements about how do you reduce this issue of violence against men and women right i mean one of course is the aspect of changing mindsets uh but it's also recognizing that there's this um this this violence this this mental state that is transmitted through people's own experiences we really don't talk enough about it in this country about about the issues that men also experience i think i think even globally it's a very tough conversation to have you only have a very few number of countries that talk about um the mental state or the mental pressure that men experience and and for me if you don't deal with the men who are the majority of the perpetrators and if you don't go to the root cause as sama was saying i really don't feel that we're really going to get anywhere sama 
um, men perpetrating violence against men, especially um, in the backdrop of uh, universities, because university ragging is a severe issue that Sri Lanka is currently uh, and has uh, for the past few decades also uh, dealt with, grappled with, but not really found a solution to. Um, how do we go about um, ending this? Okay, first of all, let me just tell you, yes, there are cases of men perpetrating violence against men, but the vast majority of uh, gender-based violence cases are of men perpetrating violence against women, right? Uh, but like Kamini said, we do have an issue of men perpetrating violence against men and that is not talked about even if they do, do talk about it that ridiculed i think one of the one of the things that we have to talk about is the fact that it's gender based violence it's it's not about whether the perpetrator is male or female it's not about whether the uh, victim survivor is male or female it's about how people use power over somebody else in in a violent manner right that's 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 the core issue here uh, definitely we have to talk about the issue sensitize people about the fact that there is an issue like that because even if a man goes to a police station and says that you know uh, I am being abused at home if it's it's if it's a woman who's abusing a man he will be ridiculed he'll be told you know can't you stand up to your woman so it's it's about this whole ma masculinity issue it's about uh, sensitizing people that violence can be perpetrated by anyone again it it can happen by anyone against anyone it shouldn't happen but that's what it happens so it's it's about talking about the issue is the first step I feel mm -hmm. uh, then also even 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 in our laws there are certain changes that we can make for example things like rape in Sri Lanka um, the perpetrator according to the present law it's only a man who can uh, rape a woman Right, so there are certain changes in law also that must take place. And then one of the biggest issues that was spoken about, you can have laws, but if the uh, judiciary is not sensitive to Do the you issue. Do think the laws are punitive enough? That I think the, they are. The punishments I, are stringent I, enough. I think the punishments are very strong. And uh, we saw some time ago, uh, we heard a case in the Anuradhapura High Court, I think, where they thought the 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 law was too punitive, and it it all went back uh, because they thought that the punishment was too strong. Uh, but I don't think the punishments are too strong. But I think they are strong enough. Do you also think that uh, maybe if uh, there was better enforcement, uh, that it would act as a deterrent? Of course, definitely. Um, this. I'm once again bringing out another book. Uh, this was uh, put together by Lawyers for Human Rights and Development and where they found out there were 129 sexual violence cases in the years 2000 and 2010 and 114 of these cases where the, 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 the perpetrator was given a suspended sentence. So what kind of message does it give? Yes. On that note, we're going for a short commercial break. Navim, you will have to hold on to your question. We'll be right back. You're watching Face the Nation. Welcome back. This is Face the Nation. We're in conversation with Kamini Jinadasa, Sama Rajakarna, Madhu Desanayaka and Lakshan Dias. My first question on this round is to Mr. Lakshan Dias, attorney at law and human rights activist. Mr. Lakshan Dias, um, gender equality is a movement that requires participation not only from women but also from men. Uh, how do we go about? Yeah, this is something I believe from my uh, early youthhood or during, from the time of my uh, youthfulness or youth uh, young days. I think the first thing we have to learn, we are. Uh, uh, I mean, not uh, learn is that men also can cry. That's where you have to start. Most of men and and we believe we should not cry. If we, if we cry, we will be like women. 
So these are the basic stereotypes that we are going through in our, uh, as men. But Mr. Dias, we have, don't you think, we have as a society failed to sensitize men across Sri Lanka to these realities? That is exactly what I'm and saying. And why, why, why do we keep failing at this? No, I think uh, one thing now, I mean, if you take the religions, Andar Buddha Jataka talks about Gehenu Kaurudu Varda Nomedena, right? And it says, it, it generalizes all women, right, can be, you know, uh, 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 they, 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 can, they can get caught into temptations, right? So, this is how the mindsets are formatted. And, and, and uh, the, 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 the stereotypes, I mean, like, only women can cry, the caregivers are only women, men are masculine, men are for fight, Men are violent. Violence, are, violence is okay. You boys, you have to be a bit violent, you know. Otherwise, you are not a boy. So all these things are still remaining in the society, in our school education, in our religious education, in our cultural education, in our day-to-day -day life, in our professions. If you behave like a little bit like more more caring person, more uh, listening person, hey, you look like a woman. I mean, why why you are not look like a man? So then those who are even trying to change their, 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 their styles, they will take step back. I think the whole problem here with us is culture. See the teledramas what we are watching today in all our channels. See the films we are watching in our channels. What we are talking, what sort of rubbish we are <coughs> showing to the, to the public. We all, every, every teledrama, every film, every drama, except for few. Right. We talk about masculinity and, and femininity and man is you know huge character, woman is a submissive thing. We have not gone beyond an inch from the same old story that we talk about 20-30 years ago. Mr. Dias, my question to you is simple. How do we go about breaking these stereotypes? Men has to come forward. Those men who are thinking differently come forward and, and challenge the systems. I mean, what will it take for these men to come forward? Well, uh, I think I think uh, the culture and the religion keep them in uh, a stagnated position uh, instead of coming out. Because you you see now there was a there was a attempt to change the certain part of the the Muslim law. But see how many how many women came for uh, together. Uh, I, I think instigated by men to to oppose that. So, like similarly, when when men come forward to take the gender issue, uh, some of them said, "Okay, why are you talking about this?" I mean, I know some really uh, 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 progressive men. When it comes to this issue, they are backward. They they, they they are scared to come forward. They are scared to come and say publicly, "Okay." I, 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 I believe this uh, uh, gender equality. So this, is, this is something culturally we have to struggle a lot. I, I strongly believe men and women have to work in partnership to challenge this. And, and men, those who are, those men who are think differently have to play a larger role if we really want to think. I mean, this whole, whole issue of uh, behave like a, in, a, in a masculine way it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a huge uh, uh, burden for a men as well. Because it, we, we show that, okay, we are trying to pretend ourselves. We are humans. Men are not superhumans. Men are human. I think one, one thing, I, I want to add this in culturally, if you take the talk of the spaces, if you, if you take 10 or 15 years ago, if you know, know women being able to step into the Vihara Mahadevi Park, today I see a lot of women are sitting in the benches and reading books in a free manner. I think I, I, I must I, I salute Gota Biraj Baksh for that. Change that atmosphere in Colombo, even though I don't like him. I <laughs> I salute for him on that matter because he changed that that whole urban change in our society gave a lot of space for women to come, to come forward and create gap their space. So men also has to support that sort of uh, uh, spaces. So right. that's not happening in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. Madhu Disanayaka is the Director of Public Affairs, Policy and Advocacy for HIV AIDS at the Sri Lanka Family Planning Association. Um, Madhu, is there a methodology to um, 
uh, I mean, is it correct to say that HIV AIDS is gendered? I think so. I think it is. I mean, in, in many, many different ways, we definitely can say it, it has a huge gender, has a huge impact. One thing is, um, uh, what, uh, what Lakshan said, I, I also want to add in something there. I think parents have a huge responsibility in addressing gender issues because that's the place where you learn uh, how stereotypical uh, ideas are being formed before you get into formal education or any other setting. So once your, your attitudes are formed, it's not easy to change. So again, we don't have formalized ways of parenting our children. In the past, it used to be from generation to generation, what your mother got to know from your grandmother, you will pass it down. But the world has changed. Things have changed. Situations have changed. We no longer uh, are in the same uh, geopolitical or global situations. We are in one global village. So therefore, I think we need to have this 21st century discussion in terms of how we are going to parent our children and what sort of concepts do we need to bring in when we are raising our kids. So taking that forward, I wanted to say in terms of HIV, if you look at the Sri Lankan statistics, uh, in the past it, was, uh, it used to be uh, more, more women used to get diagnosed with HIV because more women used to go out of the country uh, as migrant workers. So there was, there was always a history of migration. Uh, and then, why and women are more likely to be subjected to sexual harassment, intimidation, exactly, etc. Exactly. But it is not the case now. But we are we are seeing more young people. Again, the the knowledge and also more transgender, uh, male to female, transgender population uh, having the issue of um, how to protect themselves from violence and violent. Uh, partnerships or the relationships and so therefore uh, definitely in Sri Lanka and even in other parts of the world I mean if you look at the African continent definitely the gender plays a huge role in terms of HIV situation. Mother one more question uh, you spoke about uh, the importance of having comprehensive sexuality education um, how far behind are we, uh, especially given the fact that there's a great, um, g great number of incidents reported of cyber-based bullying, uh, blackmail on the rise, with um, more women really being the victims? The, the issue is, um, when we talk about comprehensive sexuality education, do we have enough people to teach comprehensive sexuality education? Because it's not just reproductive health education, which is more biological, biology based. It, the, the sexuality education or the comprehensive sexuality education is more sociological with biological aspects. So in our school uh, education system, we don't have enough uh, teachers who I believe at the moment can take up this because you need to address gender, you need to address sexuality, you need to address sexual and re uh, reproductive health, you need to address sexual diversity, you need to address sexual citizenship and you need to talk about sexual pleasure. So when you think about this vast subject, uh, we, we first have to teach this to our teachers, whoever who are going to go into schools and teach. Or we have to have a pool of trainers. Now in other countries that's what happened. It was initially with the health sector. Then they realized okay this needs to go into other sectors. So we need to train pool of trainers uh, either geographically or uh, through the education system and then start addressing these issues. We are quite behind in many ways because we haven't been able to address 
the 21st century issues like cyberbullying and violence which is which is a huge issue at the moment in Sri Lanka I think we haven't even uh, approached the tip of the iceberg because I, I feel schools need to teach when children are accessing uh, social media and and various uh, information tools how they need to protect themselves we also need to be open enough to understand that the the, the changes to your body the cha hormonal changes will make our children search for various things and in doing so they may get into certain uh, kind of relationships or engagements so without without uh, acknowledging that these things could happen and these things are happening we would not be able to go any further right now I think the acceptance needs to come all right thank you very much uh, I next move my attention to Sama Rajakarna who's an independent consultant on gender equity and women's rights uh, when it comes to women's rights, Sama, how important is it for policymakers and other stakeholders to really sit up, take notice? We've been having this dialogue over several decades, but not much movement is being, uh, not much momentum is there. Uh, how do we go about doing it? Do you think that uh, this is a responsibility solely that vests with uh, the state? or should it uh, necessitate multi-stakeholder dialogue? Yeah, uh, definitely there's a huge responsibility on the state. There definitely has to be, uh, there is state responsibility and the state has to take it very seriously. So the state is definitely one of the biggest stakeholders, but the state is not the only stakeholder. Uh, there's, like Kamini said, there's civil society, uh, there's private sector, uh, we have to all work hand in hand to ensure that this issue is taken seriously and that this issue is addressed in the proper and timely manner. Uh, we all have to play a role in that. In terms of uh, the state, which is the major stakeholder here, um, how do you think it must go about um, uh, tackling this issue? Is it by bringing in new lo legislation or is it by ensuring that the existing legislation is uh, properly implemented or is it um, by ensuring that law enforcement authorities are better trained? How do we collate all of these methodologies and really have a comprehensive framework? Yeah, it's all of that. Uh, first and foremost, to ensure that the existing laws are implemented. I mean, there are really good laws in this country which are not always effectively implemented. So, first and foremost, to ensure that these laws are implemented properly. There are, now you were talking about cyber crimes and things like that. So, there are certain issues that have come up in the recent past which need to be addressed and are not necessarily covered in our existing laws. So, there ha we have to have new laws, we have to have amendments to existing laws, so that should also be there. Uh, so it's 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 a it's a responsibility of everyone to ensure that uh, that there's proper training, proper resources are there, uh, whether it's the the police, whether it's a court system, uh, or or civil society groups to ensure, like even even funding agencies to ensure that there's proper proper uh, resources given to this issue and that this issue is not treated in an ad hoc manner that there's sustained efforts put into addressing this issue thank you very much uh, sama uh, finally kamani jinadasa is a gender consultant and a lawyer a uh, company when we speak about uh, gender-based violence uh, one of the questions that i'd like your input on is um, what of the acts of violence perpetrated against uh, the LGBT community in Sri Lanka. How, how do we look at this? Um, I think uh, there's, been, there's been a few reports that have come out in the past which talk about the sexual violence. It's, it's, it tends to steer more towards sexual violence that is perpetrated against the LGBTQ community. Um, it is 
I, it's so in, something that we always talk about is how when it comes to the LGBT community, suddenly we just talk about everything that's happening in their bedrooms. We're so concerned about that as opposed to asking these questions from heterosexuals. Mm. Um, uh, so the, the violence that they experience is, is more, it's, it's more to kind of, I don't know, it, it's 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 more to humiliate. It's more to you know subjugate them further, and of course the laws that we have in place make it happen. It 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 creates that environment where um, law enforcement believe they they feel they have they have been given the power through the law to take action. We and have archaic laws. We have archaic laws, mm. and also the fact that LGBTQ perhaps also prefer then to. To do whatever is needed instead of, like, as you call, sexual bribes, perform sexual bribes, uh, in order to avoid the criminal sentencing. Um, so these are some of the issues that are there when it comes to the LGBT community, and also um, something that you are some I'd like to allude to a bit. Um, in terms of the laws, we also have a lot of inconsistencies because we are part of CEDO, we're part of you know, uh, Child Rights Convention and all these things. And uh, for example, minimum age of marriage uh, should be 18, but we have inconsistencies in our laws. So, you know, even in personal laws and our constitution uh, gives space for the implementation of laws that are inconsistent with convention. So we, these things also need to be sorted out um, because it gives power to, to perpetration of violence of all forms. And also, I'm sorry, but I'm going back a, a bit more to add to uh, uh, something you asked from Sama. The aspect of the, the uh, all stakeholders being involved, I think one of the issues that I personally feel about gender and gender-based violence is that um, as much as it's important to take the rights-based approach, uh, there's a need for it to be translated as to what it means to a person in their day-to-day -day lives. And it's, it's only when that happens that and when people understand the multi-layered effect gender-based violence has on the health sector, in the private sector, in the education sector, at home, um, it's only then when pe will, will people really, you know, want to move forward. Um, you know, those are additional things. I mean, and I think as CSOs, we do play that. We do have a role. We do have a role of um, educating people uh, on or. Uh, engaging with uh, wider groups of people because we tend to always preach to the choir to the to the captured audience all the time and there's there's a need to really cast that net further uh, but also I do in my work I'm beginning to see a lot more men getting more interested in this work and also something that is very encouraging is the youth we have this amazing group of young people who are just so um, I, I've seen so many so so interested in these issues and really wanted to make a change and they don't know sometimes where to go and who, who to get guidance from and I think that's where mentorship plays an important role um, and I think mentorship also plays an important role in the question you posed about why is it that women are not taking up leadership positions um, it I mean, for me, my biggest question I, I keep on asking is how, is how is it that our parliamentary representation is so poor? And I mean, and, and also in a way we see it in the women's movement as well in Sri Lanka. We don't see enough mentorship for feminists to come up, to come forward, be it men or women. And um, I feel as a whole that is a culture we need to start bringing in uh, more of, you know, coaching, mentoring encouraging people who are interested in the work. Otherwise, it's, it's kind of almost uh, elitist, uh, you know, in a way. I, may, I might be opening a Pandora's box here, but um, it's something I feel personally as, as a feminist also who has been coming forward. Thank you very much. Uh, Kamini Jinadasa, gender consultant and lawyer. We open uh, the floor for questions. Let's start off with the gentleman. Thank you. Uh, Kamini, uh, you were talking about the role of civil society organizations. There's something interesting that I've noticed uh, 
uh, having been to several uh, forums and discussions on uh, things like sexuality, sexual orientation, gender-based violence, when it comes to these topics, the discussion tends to be always in English and very rarely, if ever, in either Sinhalese or Tamil. Why is this? I think uh, maybe it's connected to what I said before. Um, I think... Is there a reluct... Uh, I'll rephrase it. Is there a reluctance on the part of civil society organizations to sort of uh, conduct such programs in native languages like Sinhala and Tamil and sort of expose yourself to uh, backlash? Okay, from perhaps if... Maybe I could answer it this way. Um, something I have felt by being in this field of work, not only in Sri Lanka but overseas as well, is that um, civil society plays a very important role in bringing, opening the space for communities, for community, for CBOs to come up, for the field voices to come up. We don't, we're not um, focused enough, we don't make enough effort for that to happen. Um, and uh, we take the easy way out and in that way you know I think people who are more based in Colombo we are losing such rich sources of information um, because uh, when you go out into the field the lessons and the voices are just there's so much passion there's so much there which we do not listen to enough and um, and and also one of the reasons I mean the key reasons why the CBOs or the community level organizations are not heard is because of course they're not conversant enough in English and I think and I think once again CSOs, not only CSOs, I think everyone has an important role to play in creating the opportunity for them to to you know to create linkages or to support them to be heard um, and also recognizing that we're a country where you know Sinhala and Tamil are our national languages I mean I mean, would you care to weigh in on this? Why is it that Nadeem, can there is I, a can lack? I, can I challenge you about what you said? Yeah, I, 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 I totally disagree to. with you. Yes, because exactly. I brought up in my, uh, my, my youth, uh, my young days, and even up, up to recent time, with a lot of feminist movements. There were a lot of feminist leaders among us in the 80s, in 90s, and starting from Rajini, Tiranagama, and then talk about many, Sunila Abhisekar, and she got the, the highest UN award. There are so many feminist leaders in this country, not only in Colombo, but all over the country. There were so there are still so many women organizations existing in the rural but only I only point I agree with, those are not coming into the into the, the limelight. They they, they they do their work, they do, they do their activism in the periphery, in the regions, in the provinces. They're doing large amount of work. But only the the elite work is highlighted in Colombo. I agree with you. That. It doesn't come into the the mainstream. Discussion. It doesn't. It doesn't come into the mainstream. But we have to be. Ha we have to have, have. I mean, even even this whole uh, the the movement in Palawat uh, and 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 Sevanagala sugar companies. The women lead lead. I'm, even the plantation sector. There are so many women leaders in the north and east. There are. I mean, there are so many women leaders. Start. I mean, even we have to treat Tamilini as a women leader. Tamilini is a women leader. We have, whether we like it or not. So there are so many women leaders, there are so many feminist groups, there are so many women's organizations. The only thing I, I agree with you is those, those people will not be taken seriously because Madhu, of Madhu, maybe language. Like Madhu, yeah. you spoke about parenting earlier. Yes. Um, now we, we also spoke about changing mindset and education reforms. All those take time. So where does a family, where does parent, or where do parents start with their kids, you know? Firstly to make them uh, understand that harassment mm. is mm. wrong and unacceptable. Mm. Where, where do you, how do you teach them to draw the line at what age? Right. Uh, let me first answer Nadim's question because I think it's very important as an organization we work around the country. And for us, I think my, my biggest issue had been uh, the discomfort of talking about sexuality in our own native language because it is not taught using appropriate language. So the language that we use to talk about sexuality is already seen as derogatory. So how do you explain it in the best possible way where one feels, you know, it doesn't demean me. Now, 
we we have come up with various glossaries and terminologies to address this and i think we are trying to trying to do a good job but uh, like Khamani said, there is an issue, but I still feel that when we go out to the periphery or to the rural areas or to the provinces, depending on the, depending on the language that they are using, we will always do our programs. Uh, this is what I wanted to uh, get at, because there is a, a huge ling linguistics uh, issue here. Yes. Uh, as in, yes. maybe in the national languages, you are lacking the terminology to describe certain yes. concepts. Yes. How do you fix that? Well, we, I mean, you know, uh, each century I think we, we, we get new language, we, we uh, include, I mean, you know, uh, at this moment, I mean, the good governance word has become a hapalanir and everybody uses that for good governance. But what I'm saying is, uh, we have to introduce good language for our language to enrich. and same thing with the subject matter because this was taught in universities, this was taught in medical faculties so the language was pretty much heavily medicalized. Now we have to bring it to the social arena and be able to use those suitable language that people can understand. So I'm sure we are, we are getting there. We are trying our level best to make sure that our children, whoever who speaks in Sinhala, Tamil or English have adequate language plus those who speak in braille and in sign. We cannot forget them as well. So this is a challenge. This is a big challenge but we are trying to address it. In coming to your question about parenting, I, I personally think, uh, I think last time also when I was here I said you know when you, when you buy a car, before you buy a car you learn how to drive. And sadly, we still haven't thought about this process. We, we are now uh, a, a kind of looking at it in the sense like how much of father's involvement is there during mother's you know, uh, pregnancy or during the, uh, the partner's pregnancy and, and whether he's involved in delivery and things like that. But going beyond that, as parents, how do you discuss these whole gender aspects and how do you deal with things? Who changes nappies? Because this is what you see is what you're going to believe. As a child, if you see that the, the diversification of your daily chores, your mother and father, uh, they both do equal amount of uh, things uh, without uh, you know, uh, segregating that this is what father should do and this is what mother should do. And I think these are the little gestures that we can definitely show. So f starting from there, I think there should be more conversations happening around how do we address it. And this is also about sexuality. Parents can teach their children. I think parents are the best to teach their children or introduce this subject if they know what sort of language they can use because for them if they are adequately equipped with the, the suitable language I'm sure they will feel more comfortable so we we have to look at ways maybe we have to be innovative some countries had videos developed for parents how do you use unconventional words to describe your you know to have a discussion with your young adolescent children how do you deal with questions like uh, uh, how did I come out or where did I come out from or you know wh what would you say do you should you say the right the, the correct information should you give the correct information or should you just create something no now we say you say the correct thing to the child you give the correct information to the child so things like that we are, I mean, you know, there are lots of people who are looking at it and we need more research done. We need more tools developed. The tools are lacking in this aspect and we need to come up with them. Sama, I would like to ask you, um, <coughs> now, uh, the women, uh, say for example, if you lose a loved one, maybe a husband or a son is reported missing, you often find that woman uh, becomes a human rights uh, defender. You know, she has to deal with law enforcement, authorities to maybe to get paperwork done, compensation, all that. But, you know, the lack of sensitivity in institutions, do you see that as a, 
obstacle for these women to um, you know uh, be actual activists and also um, what kind of support do they get from their male you know fa f the males in their families to uh, you know uh, in this profession or you know if they take up uh, to defend human rights right after being vulnerable or being a victim yeah. i'm not sure whether i'm the right person to answer this question so pitch in if you can <laughs> uh, but uh, there are lots of barriers women face when they have to uh, go and get something. For example, if they've lost, like you said, if they've lost a loved person and they have to go to government or uh, government agencies and organizations and places, first of all, movement. You know, sometimes these people may be people who may not have had the chance to go from their village to another village. Now they have to come to the capital. Right? They may not have the resources to do that. Uh, they may not have. They may not have the know-how to do that. Right? So they, they, there are lots of barriers from starting from movement that they have to face. Uh, and when they do go there, uh, there could be language barriers. Uh, they go there and like you said, they are not taken seriously. You know, they, they're sent home, they're told to come back the next day uh, and they may not have the resources to do so. So there are many problems. But when it comes to activism and women, I'm going back again to this whole socialization process. Right? It's, it's the way the women have been brought up from, I would say, before day one also. The way they, when they find out a girl is being born, the, the, the way that news is received, the way that the rooms are decorated, from the time uh, they are born, the, the toys that they are given, uh, what kind of skills are given to these women. So it goes way back. It's this whole socialization process. You're told not to climb trees. You're told not to laugh out loud. You're, not, you're told not to speak too loud. So this, these are all skills that you do not learn. So when it comes to a certain purpose, you don't have those skills. So you, your, your skills are limited and you have, you don't, unless, unless you uh, specifically go and learn these skills, you are, you have a disability, right? So these, this, this starts from, like I said before, day one. It's a whole socialization process. Uh, I don't Mother, know. Do you want to could I also add? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Um, the risk of sounding a bit controversial um, um, about um, women's voices being heard and coming up. I remember a program that was held at FPA a few weeks ago with, by the female parliamentarians to promote female parliamentarians. And um, uh, something that struck me and I remember now is how uh, women from the north are very empowered. There's, there's a strong leadership from, from the North. And when I think the question was posed, if I'm not mistaken, as to how that happened. And um, the lady who came from Jaffna, she was talking about how the LTT leadership ensured that there was equal representation, um, that there was the quota for women, and therefore the support was provided. And um, that is why this is a multi-pronged multi approach that needs to be taken. Um, leadership, political leadership plays a very important role in creating the space also. Um, that, and I think, yeah, that's, that's what I yeah. actually wanted to so, say. But, I mean, we are, we are not saying that women don't have agency. We are not saying women are all vulnerable. It's just that the way, the way our culture is, our society is, Sometimes women are not given these opportunities unless they go seek it out or you know they're, they're stronger women who, who, who kind of enable themselves and go out there. Um, so this, I, I, I strongly believe that this socialization process there has to be a big change in this and that's where we, we started off by saying the education system, media, all of these people have a huge role to play in changing this. Uh, Kamini and Lakshman, Lakshman, since we have two lawyers on the panel today, I also want to cover uh, another issue. This uh, morning's newspapers reported uh, another uh, incident of rape in the country. This is in the Uruhara area, an incident of gang rape, this time where 
uh, the victim and her partner had been abducted, taken into a jungle area. I don't have the statistics for 2016, but I'm going to focus on the 2014 and 15 statistics for rape from Sri Lanka police. Uh, 2014, uh, 2008 cases of rape, uh, incidents of child sexual abuse have been registered as 377. Of these, there are still 1,972 pending. Uh, 2015, the reporting is a little better. They've actually broken it down to statutory rape with consent, without consent, and rape of women over 16 as well. But even here, it's the figures are quite high, uh, especially for statutory rape uh, with consent. 1,338, 379 rape of women over 16, 315 statutory rape without consent. But here again, most of these cases are pending. Uh, there has been in 2014, one conviction for rape from, of those cases, four convictions, uh, child sexual abuse. 2015, one conviction for all those cases. Now, we know that when it comes to law enforcement, the police is just one aspect of law enforcement. You then have the judiciary and the courts. We know that there is a massive backlog in the courts as well. What's concerning to me here is how many of these are pending at the Attorney General's department? Hundreds of cases pertaining to rape. Basically, it's gone through the process of the magistrate's court, and you're just waiting for the Attorney General to file charges. Why? Can you enlighten us? As, as no. being in the legal profession, you handle a lot of cases of domestic violence and rape. Come here, you're a lawyer and an advocate. Why? What I see is uh, on, the, on the issue of child abuse, everybody is quick. Everybody is uh, trying to respond because you know it's a kind of a social accepted, socially accepted thing that we have to stop somehow. But when it comes to rape of women, the the speed is not not like that. I mean, not in the judiciary, not in the police, not in even the general department, because. I think the whole, uh, again, the, the, the mindset works, well, women are asking those things. That's why they got it. That's the attitude in today. I mean, and most of the countries, they are, uh, most of, I mean, some sort of, they said, if you are, we are, you are wearing less clothes, that's why you got raped. So I think uh, uh, one, one thing, in my, my, my opinion, the slowness is, is the mindset issue. If, if there is a speedy action for the child abuse cases, why, why can't we take the same attitude towards the, uh, the rape of women? But my, specifically to do with the Attorney General's department. I mean, these are educated people in the uh, lawyers who are in the Attorney you General's know, my, department. My <laughs> why is there more than hundreds of no, rape it's cases? large pending? number, more than hundreds. It can be thousands sometimes. Large number yeah, of because cases are just for two years. lying there in, in, in the Attorney General Department. Uh, in my opinion, what we have to do, if, if the, the cases are delaying, we have to challenge the Attorney General Department. I mean, they come out with their own excuses, but we should not uh, agree with what, they ex what is their excuse. We have to challenge. Because finally, the Attorney General Department is also a department to serve people. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a government institution. So if uh, the things are not delivered, at a certain spe uh, speed, I think we have to challenge. I mean, I don't see any reason. Of course, there is a backlog. There is there <coughs> is a backlog between the Attorney General Department, but they they should prioritize some of these. Uh, uh, How many your your cases. response? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, well, um, so a few years ago there was an initiative to uh, expedite child abuse cases, which. Um, uh, by the simple act of just tying a yellow ribbon around the case files which related to child abuse, which actually did speed up the process. And um, there's also the child-friendly court system. We have one of two, what, the main court in uh, Batramulla. Uh, it's the closed court. So, you know, I think the importance is, yes, there's the mindset of thinking that rape, uh, when it comes to sexual gender-based violence, it's not important enough to really take it seriously enough. That's that mindset that needs to be changed. Uh, and also the need for a very specific approach, um, a very sensitive approach, because, I mean, it takes a lot. I mean, even forget rape. I mean, those of us, if we've experienced some kind of abuse or uh, sexual abuse, it takes so much to come out and say it. I mean, experiences I've had as a child, it's taken me years to even come out with that this, you know. And so for even for a rape case, it takes so much. And um, I, it, it, 
it is really terrible how in this country and actually not only in Sri Lanka in a lot of countries uh, this this is the case and in Sri Lanka we have a the added layer of a real laws delayed like justice delayed process in this country which really does need to change and um, I think and these are these are the places where I feel we don't agitate enough we don't make enough noise you know yeah because once when looking at the s stats something I realize is if it does make it to district court or high court then there is the likeliness that you get a conviction and it uh, doesn't really take uh, that long my my question there is why why is now the AG's department I, so slow? Can I ask another question? How can you speed them up? Because challenging the AG's department in court may not be feasible. That might just be another <laughs> some more litigation that will take several years uh, to be resolved. Now, if I think to, to answer this question, we'll need uh, more time than uh, we Sorry, have Madhu, with us. Madhu, but uh, Madhu yeah. yes, you I can respond. I, I just wanted to uh, kind of bring in a different perspective to this uh, statistic also what you actually gave. Um, how many of those cases reported could be consensual? Uh, because now we have this issue where when you're 15 or sometimes, sometimes you, you may be under 16. Still you have a boyfriend of 18 or above and have a relationship and you have engaged in a sexual activity. Once that gets notified, okay, you will report, but then you feel, no, we don't want to go ahead with the case. Because eh, the, the families decide, no, it's no point. With that, I'm, I'm just raising this because there was one time a huge uh, a, a kind of a um, statement made by one of the former ministers where the children should get or the ones who got uh, raped should get married to I mean you know um, uh, uh, the person and that the, then actually some of us actually asked what what is this and we were told a lot of young people have eloped with their boyfriends but they are under 18 so that they cannot get married but they are in a consensual relationship so if if you are a consenting adult or you know for sex you can con uh, consent at the age of 16 but for marriage like Kamani said we have an issue there so again when you when you uh, have those statistics why some yes justice delayed and the issues of the court system all that is there but then again we need to look at the social aspect sometimes parents may not be wanting to take it any further knowing that this is actually not the issue this is actually two people consenting to each other that's that's true in the case of uh, statutory uh, with consent. But what about the other incidents of rape without consent and, uh, and <coughs> actual just, just outright rape? Even that's those are not being prosecuted. Yeah, I, I think we all have to agree that there's a delay in, yes. in the in the attorney general department, and with which we need to address seriously. And I think, in my opinion, attorney general department has to prioritize some of their cases. I mean, like what like what they do for child abuse, they have to prioritize the. The, uh, uh, does rape also. Do you think the AGS department lacks the resources to take but That's on? what they said. I mean, I, I can't talk for them. But even though even they, they are going through lack of resources, but uh, the violence against body, violence against, against uh, women has to take uh, uh, very seriously. Because justice it, delayed is justice denied. We're going for a short commercial break, our final break this time. And we'll be right back with the final round. Welcome back. This is the final round on Face the Nation. My final question is to Kamani. Uh, Kamani, earlier on in the show, you said that you were a feminist. So I'd like to ask you, what does it really mean to be a feminist? Uh, you get the traditional feminist, the extreme feminist. Uh, is, it, is it a man-hating, uh, unkept um, female who um, says no to the guy who tries to get the door for you. I mean, what really is the definition of women, uh, a feminist? Because 
uh, today we find the, the term feminazi being coined. Uh, can you shed some light on this? Um, I think in a way I've been guilty of a few of those things myself. Uh, but the thing is being a feminist is quintessentially about standing up for women's rights, women's issues. Sadly, it's, 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 it's associated with the, you know, as, as though it's something bad and you automatically become more viewed as being more masculine or, you know. But Justin Trudeau, the Canadian Prime Minister, uh, is pr proud to call himself a, pe a feminist. So exactly. uh, does Barack Obama. Yeah, I know. And um, it's a shame because, because of this kind of, uh, in a way, a stigma. Or, uh, it's not the proper word to use, but this, the way that we look at this term uh, of being a feminist, you find a lot of young people also being a bit reluctant to come forward as a feminist. I mean, even for me, I remember um, having, uh, f uh, questioning myself a little bit about, okay, at which point do I actually call myself a feminist? I, I, I prefer to be more the neutral, uh, in the neutral space of saying I'm a, I, I believe in human rights, human rights for all, but the more you're in this work, you realize that there's a really need to be more focused on the women's issues and, and, and also hold the term being a feminist with pride because it is something to be really proud of if it wasn't for the feminists around the world in this country uh, where would we be really um, and um, it's uh, it's 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 something I think I think uh, we we really do need to move around like removing the bad associate the negative association towards it and I think I think the work and, and and men who who have been coming forward as feminists have also been helping break the this mold or this assumption of what it is to be a feminist. Um, yeah. Kamani, ideally, wh what would you want to happen, um, given the fact that you are a GBV uh, activist, uh, in, in terms of educating uh, the public of, of Sri Lanka? What is the ideal situation? The ideal situation is understanding that GBV affects all. And, and when I say that, I mean it's something that affects men and women and transgender. And holding that, you know, really, really understanding how multi layered it is and how many people that it's that their reasons, their contributing factors, their deeper reasons as to how violence is perpetrated and how it is everyone's responsibility. Except not only for us feminists or the feminazi, if that's what we're going to be called in a few days' time, or you know, just say you know, um, uh, yeah, see, uh, civil society. It's, it everyone is responsible for it, and that's what I would like to see. You know. Thank you very much. Uh, Sama Raja Karuna, how important is it for civil society organizations and activists to join hands with the government uh, in order to ensure that more is done in the field of gender-based violence? Yeah. I don't think anything that, that is done in isolation is successful. Everything has to be done in a sort of a partnership. So that partnership should run across civil society, organizations, private sector, the state institutions as well. Uh, without that partnership, I don't think it will be a sustainable uh, sort of development that we achieve. For it to be sustainable, we have to work together. I think is, that's very Is that important. being done enough now? There is, right now, there is a lot of political will by the state to engage with other actors, I feel, uh, more so than um, in the recent past. Uh, there is more engagement through discussions, um, through uh, seeking opinions, getting experts involved, like civil society experts are put into panels and commissions and things like that. So there's a lot more engagement going on at the moment. Thus far in this journey, why have we as a society failed in countering violence against women? I don't think we have failed. I don't think we have achieved the maximum, but I definitely don't think that we have failed. Uh, we, like I said before, there has been a lot of progress made. There's a lot of progress that has been 
made, uh, but there's a long way to go. Thank you very much, Thank uh, you. Madhu Desanayaka. Uh, we speak about um, trauma uh, after uh, sexual violation. Um, what are the mechanisms that we have available in Sri Lanka for young men, women, uh, the LGBT community to really go to someone or an institution and really talk about their issues. Uh, what about psycho, um, psychosocial care, counseling? Are these available in Sri Lanka? <coughs> and not just in Colombo, not just in Colombo suburbs, but across the country. Yeah, this is, this is one big issue. I mean, um, in terms of service delivery for uh, sexual abuse or uh, any kind of sexual violation, um, you know, we first must understand that one, when when a person is, uh, uh, when a person has faced such a such a situation or in a such a situation, it's very difficult to go and seek services. So, by having a service several miles away or by having a service centrally located, will not. Uh, be adequate when a person is faced with violence. So the situation here is that the Ministry of Health has uh, started um, a program called Mitru Piesa. Again, uh, that is a gender-based violence um, uh, service provi uh, provision um, uh, arm of the Ministry of Health care guidelines were provided about three, four years back. The, the staff were trained. Uh, also with Family Planning Association, we have our service delivery points in six districts as well as in Colombo. And uh, we also have uh, women in need for legal aid and other kinds of uh, psychosocial support, but counseling is the most important part our understanding of seeking counseling services when you're faced with something like this is still not adequate uh, and do I really need to go again it's it's a post-traumatic stress disorder how often we, we would like to address that people are having that sort of uh, conditions I think as a nation that had undergone 30 years of war or, or a conflict. As a nation, we all have to get together and ask ourselves, do we need that kind of psychosocial support to understand what sort of a past we all have had? So my, my feeling is there is a certain amount of services being delivered at the moment. It may not be adequate to support the amount of violence that women face or men face or young people but I also want to highlight the fact that we mustn't forget elderly we are a growing nation of elders so again violence is another aspect uh, that we must focus when we are aging as a nation also so all these factors need to factor in when we are uh, when we are developing a service package very quickly, Madhu, if there are policymakers uh, watching this show right now, what is your message? <laughs> My key message is to implement what is already there. If, if, you, if we can do gender sensitive budgeting, gender responsive budgeting, and implement, so provide money, material, and manpower to implement those, then I am sure we'll be, be in a better place than this. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lakshan Dias. My final question for the night is uh, uh, to you. Um, we spoke a lot about the relationship of power, um, inequality of uh, power also. How important is it to sensitize law enforcement authorities in going about overcoming gender-based violence? I think it's very important. I mean, I, I think we have to overcome so many things. Let's start with small point. We have to either abolish or reform the Vagrants Act. 
it was introduced in 1841 to to stop uh, estate workers going one estate to another but that now today they are using it for to take uh, commercial sex workers and transgenders into custody so there are so many obsolete uh, outdated laws in this country and the law enforcement authorities are not sensitized enough about these things i mean even even the domestic violence act i think when uh, a, a victim goes to police uh, they, they they try to treat them in different ways sometimes they said okay you just try another chance you go today and come another day so the all these law enforcement authorities judiciary need to be sensitized uh, sensitized on this issue of uh, uh, law and then also uh, the the necessity for legal reforms otherwise we will leave this is all old obsolete and outdated laws and it will will not lead our country to anywhere so thank I you that's very important thank you very much uh, I'd like to thank our panel of eminent personalities Kamani Jinadasa gender consultant and lawyer thank you for being on our show tonight Sama Rajakarna who's an independent consultant on gender equity and women's rights hope you enjoyed the show yes I did thank you Madhu Disanayaka, Director of Public Affairs Policy and Advocacy for HIV AIDS at the Sri Lanka Family Planning Association. Thanks, Madhu. Thank I hope the message uh, to policymakers is heard. We uh, hope so. And finally, Mr. Lakshanda, is attorney at law and human rights activist. Thank you, sir, for being on Thank our you. show tonight. Nadi Majid and Charita Fernando, thanks for all the questions. Um, before wrapping up, I, I think we need to also place on record that we went 30 minutes over time. Uh, which means uh, the producer has been constantly um, <laughs> been in my ear. Well, women's organization submissions to the Public Representations Committee on Constitutional uh, Reform have also stressed the importance of addressing the history and reality of systemic marginalization uh, faced uh, by women, including sex workers, persons of diverse sexual orientation and gender identities in Sri Lanka, despite the equality clause in the Constitution. We are yet to see what will come of the third Republican Constitution of Sri Lanka, the proposed third Republican Constitution. I uh, leave you tonight with a quote from Muhammad Ali Jinnah. He said, there are two persons in the world. One is the sword and the other is the pen. There is a great competition and a rivalry between the two. There is a third power stronger than both, that of the women. Take care and good night.